Good morning, everyone. This is a presentation by Ryan Nangle and Austin Bernardo, Bertana. And they're presenting on the Dialogger 3, which is an app that tracks physical activity and modeling uh, blood glucose levels. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, thank you for our, that kind introduction. Uh, as he just said, I'm Ryan Nangle. This is my partner, <coughs> Austin. Um, we are here to present about Dialogger, a mobile app to help people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, this project was started in the fall of 2015 by a group of ISAT seniors. Um, we joined the project in the fall of 2016 and have been excited to work on it ever since. First, uh, we are going to talk about chronic diseases and the burden they place on individuals that suffer with them as well as the society as a whole. Then we're going to specifically talk about the struggle of living with diabetes. Um, then we are going to talk about uh, what our project is and what the Dialogger app does. Uh, then we're going to talk about the contributions the previous teams made, the contributions we made, and the future contributions that we hope future teams will make. So we're going to start with chronic diseases. Um, chronic disease is a disease that persists for three months or longer. Uh, chronic diseases generally cannot be uh, prevented by vaccine, vac vaccines or cured by medication, uh, nor do they just disappear. Um, as you can see here in these uh, pictures, uh, more than about half of the world currently lives with a chronic disease. Um, it is also projected by 2020 that 81 million of Americans will be living with multiple chronic diseases. and. Um, Almost all of this disease management lie in the hands of the individual and their families. Um, so this slide shows uh, the top 10 uh, most expensive chronic diseases. Um, this information is based off the latest Centers for Disease Control and Prevention data. Um, so as you can see, diabetes is the fourth most expensive chronic disease right now. Um, it is actually cost $245 billion per year. Um, from this data, 71% um, of this cost comes from uh, direct medical costs, um, and the rest comes from loss of productivity. This loss of productivity comes from being absent from work, um, being less productive at work, or not being able to work because of diabetes. <coughs> So as stated in the last slide, um, diabetes is the fourth most expensive with $245 billion per year um, in costs. Um, this graph here shows a little more uh, detailed what this cost goes to. Um, this is more of the medical cost. I don't know if you guys can read that, but 48% of the cost goes to hospital inpatient care. 20% um, goes to medication to treat diabetes, 13% uh, goes to anti-diabetic agents and diabetes supplies, 10% goes to physician office visits, and 9% goes to nursing and residential facility stays. Um, individuals with diabetes um, have medical costs 2.3 times higher than if they did not have diabetes. So this map shows currently, or in 2007, how many people had diabetes per region of the world. It also shows um, the predicted value of how many people will have diabetes in 2045. As you can see, the number is increasing in every region of the world. So it is going to be a big disease uh, in a few years. Um, these represent the... Um, numbers of the sum of type 1 diabetes and type 2, um, but these two are vastly different. So this table shows a difference between type 1 diabetes and type 2. Um, at first, the trigger for type 1 diabetes as of now is unknown. Doctors do not know what causes uh, disease. For type 2 diabetes, uh, it comes from poor lifestyle choices and genetics. Um, the onset of type 1 diabetes is very sudden. 
it comes very fast and you cannot really see it coming. Uh, for type 2 diabetes, it's more gradual. Uh, it's a constant uh, poor lifestyle choices and it eventually co comes on. Um, the age of onset, of onset for type 1 diabetes is typically younger individuals. And for type 2 diabetes, it's typically older uh, individuals. But recent uh, studies uh, are telling us that the age for type 2 diabetes is getting a lot younger because individuals are having worse and worse lifestyle choices and poor habits. Um, so the treatment for type 1 diabetes is daily insulin uh, intakes. And for type 2 diabetes, it's daily medicine. Um, as of right now, type 1 diabetes is not preventable. Uh, doctors have no uh, medication or vaccines to prevent this. Uh, for type 2 diabetes, it is preventable with better lifestyle choices and uh, just better eating habits. Uh, lastly, uh, as of now, there is no cure for type 1 diabetes. Uh, if you uh, get the disease, you have it for life for now. Um, and for type 2 diabetes, with better lifestyle choices and eating habits, uh, individuals are able to uh, mitigate the symptoms. Um, so that was uh, both of them, but our focus is on type 1 diabetes. Um, so <clears throat> type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease in which a person's pancreas stops producing insulin. Um, insulin is a hormone that um, allows your body to use uh, glucose or the sugar that you intake for energy. Um, insulin is also required to store this energy into your cells for later use. Um, in this picture here, uh, these red arrows represent the misguided attack on the pancreas beta cells. Um, these beta cells uh, have the main function of uh, storing and releasing insulin. So these dark circles represent um, dead beta cells in the pancreas, and from this uh, results in a decrease in insulin, and from that results in a rise in blood sugar levels, which is not good for the individual. Um, <clears throat> so the management for type 1 diabetes uh, takes a lot of time, effort, and materials. This is just a few materials that it takes to manage. Um, at first, type 1 diabetics need to monitor their blood glucose level, and before modern technology, this required pricking a finger five times a day and inserting into a blood glucose reader. And to the patient, this can be very time consuming, uh, take a lot of effort, and might be uncomfortable for them. Uh, new technology um, has made this a lot easier, um, which um, comes from a continuous blood glucose uh, monitor, which is placed under the skin. This definitely takes away all the time consuming uh, finger pricks and re reading them. Um, next, uh, type one diabetes diabetics need to monitor their food intake and their exercise. So <clears throat> this requires uh, daily logs and a way to you know, track everything they're doing. Um, so without an organized plan, this might become hard for the individual. Um, right here, um, the last thing type one diabetics need to do um, is two medical checkups every year. So for a week prior to these checkups, they need to complete a log like this one shown. This is from uh, the first team, um, I think her, uh, her name was Anna, and um, <coughs> these logs include uh, blood glucose level, carb intake, um, insulin intake, and the times of this intake. Um, so these papers are currently doctor, the doctor recommended process to record this data. And as you can see, um, many problems can arise from this. Um, maybe uh, young individuals might get embarrassed to carry around a piece of paper and log everything they're doing constantly every day. Um, it might make them feel different and uh, make them stand out. Um, busy individuals might think this is uh, way too time consuming to have to 
write down everything they eat, everything they do in the day. Um, and then other individuals might not have a place to store this um, big piece of paper with them every day and some information might get lost. Um, also, um, this paper could get lost halfway through the week and all this information could be lost uh, and this just is not a very great, good way to uh, record this information. So uh, <clears throat> what if there was an easier way to manage and record all this information? Um, that is what, where we got the idea for this app. So that is where Dialogger comes in. Uh, the story begins with Anna. Uh, at age six, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Um, and from that day forward, she figured out that in order to survive, she would have to inject herself with insulin every day. This placed a huge strain on her and all of her family members. Uh, Dialogger is a mobile application to help people uh, manage their con uh, type 1 diabetes. Uh, it allows them to collect and track information that uh, influences their blood glucose levels. Uh, this, uh, these factors include stress, uh, sleep, insulin intake, carb intake, physical activity, uh, their blood glucose level, and um, all, all of those other factors. Um, yeah, screenshots. Uh, so when you would first open the app, uh, you would see this page. Um, this just uh, is like an intro, introduction page to tell you what to do. Um, if you would hit, hit enter, it would bring you to the middle page. Uh, this shows you all the fields that someone would have to fill out uh, in order to create an entry for their blood glucose level. Uh, you'd have to tell them uh, the date that you were creating an entry, the time, uh, the blood glucose level that you uh, received from your measurement, and the amount of insulin you were going to take. Uh, after you hit enter, you would go to the next page, uh, which would show you a graph of all your previous entries. Um, this helps the person see uh, their trends um, and helps them better manage their uh, blood glucose level. Uh, finally, uh, this is a micro to macro plan for Dialogger. Um, at the beginning, we you know, just thought about the patients and how to help them. Um, the app helps them manage their disease by showing them uh, their data and the patterns in their daily lifestyle. Um, the next level up, would be doctors receiving this information. Um, this would help them create better management strategies for their patients individually. Um, and then one level up from that is all of the data collected from Dialogger um, from all the different patients would be hopefully given to researchers that would want access to this data. Um, using this data, they could create um, different uh, management strategies and potentially even a cure one day. Um, so this capstone project is uh, the third, or we are the third team of this project as a whole. Um, the first team um, was uh, the creator of, or the originator of Dialogger. Um, this team took on the project the, in fall of 2005, or 15. Um, they came up with the idea for Dialogger they did all the background research uh, needed for, um, to make an app like this, and they eventually were able to create the baseline application. <clears throat> um, this app had a home page like you saw in the previous slides, and it had three input pages. Um, these input pages had, were a BGL input page, an insulin intake page, and a sleep log page. <laughs> Um, and they also had a fourth page, which was the trends page, which gave um, visual representation of the data uh, recorded. Um, the second team um, came onto this project in the fall of 2016, along with me and Ryan. Um, their uh, contribution was to improve the communication and overall relationship uh, between doctors and patients. Um, this team came to the conclusion that um, uh, it would be more efficient for doctors to read this information and see these trends on a web application instead of on a mobile application. So they were able to eventually 
create a baseline web application for doctors to read and um, look at all the data recorded. Uh, this leads us to our contribution. Um, when we first received the code, uh, a lot of it had become out of date just to uh, inactivity of writing it. Um, for example, Angular 2 had become Angular 4. Um, Angular was the um, program that we used to uh, write lots of the functions. Um, and lots of the functions that we used in Angular 2, a lot of the prefabricated code, uh, became out of date and had to be replaced or changed when it was updated to Angular 4. This process was you know, very slow going, not very exciting, um, and eventually led us to almost rebuild the app entirely. Uh, when we were doing this rebuild, uh, we thought it was important to uh, add state management. Um, the state of an app is an object that contains all the properties that are related to the user. Whenever any of those properties change, the state changes. Um, and it's important to keep the state uh, as stable as possible because if you make a change on the app, you want to make sure that it relates to a change in the database and that they're all on the uh, same page. Um, the big contribution that we were trying to make was to create a predictive algorithm for blood glucose levels. Uh, we first took a look at um, two data sets that were already created, uh, the UCI machine learning and the Dexacom data sets. Uh, the UCI data set is one that's been used in many papers um, about diabetes. Uh, it has lots of good information. Uh, the data set was collected through two sources, one automated and one paper recorded. The automated had an automatic timestamp, uh, so it's got very accurate um, data. The paper recordings were more generally uh, timestamped, like breakfast, dinner, lunch. Um, this data, while it's very good, is not as robust as we were hoping. Uh, so we found the Dexacom data set. Dexacom is a company that creates uh, continuous glucose monitors. Uh, the data set contained um, records for blood glucose every five minutes for two years for multiple people. Um, this was extremely robust, robust and provided a lot of the data that we, re we were going to use for our project. Uh, the first method we used to try and find a way to predict blood glucose was discrete time Markov chain. Um, this is a way to predict changes in state. Um, for us, our states were uh, normal blood glucose, higher than we wanted and lower than we wanted. Um, in order to come up with this algorithm, we needed to count how many times it changed from low to high, uh, from normal to high, from normal to low. Um, and this well, took a lot of time, but after we got through that, we inputted that data into the algorithm and it produced uh, this model for us. Uh, unfortunately, the model is too stable. Uh, that basically means that uh, the number of times that we switched states uh, wasn't high enough to allow us to predict when it would happen. Um, the algorithm basically would only predict that it would stay within a single state, um, which doesn't really help us accomplish what we wanted. Uh, the next thing we tried was Bayesian change point analysis. Um, this is a way to find uh, where in a data set it changes greatly. Um, we took all of our data and we boiled it down to the first three days. Um, these graphs show the analysis done after those three days. Um, using the PELT method, we uh, were able to find the optimal number of change points and the locations of those change points. Uh, those can be seen by these red lines. Um, if you can see them, uh, it's kind of uh, easy to see that they're broken up into three levels. Um, more so, uh, those three levels would be the normal uh, high and low. Uh, if you were to average out, all of this day, all of the day's data uh, that you collected, you would be able to find points in the day when your blood glucose was at risk of leaving the normal level. While this wasn't exactly what we were hoping to find, uh, it is definitely a good start um, for a predictive model. Um, the reason that we weren't able to predict, you know, exactly the time that the changes would occur, is because the data sets didn't have enough independent variables for us to look at. Um, only giving the blood glucose level was not enough for us to predict exactly when you would change. 
if we were given a data set like the one that Dialogger is going to create, we would be able to do a cluster analysis, uh, which basically means that uh, all the data points would be put into certain clusters and the algorithm would be able to predict which cluster the new point would go into. Um, the reason we weren't able to do this is because there weren't enough independent variables, but if you took sleep, physical activity, and all these other independent variables that uh, Dialogger would be able to collect, you would be able to hopefully do a cluster analysis. <clears throat> so what our goal for this capstone project is uh, in the upcoming years uh, is first, we would like to uh, find more students to take on this project. So if there's any sophomores out there that do not have a project yet, uh, we would like you to, to join this team. Um, and after we have more people working on it, we would uh, eventually like to add a um, uh, um, feature that would be able to track your physical activity. Um, this would come from using um, uh, these devices like a Misfit or an Inspire or a Fitbit. And uh, yeah. Uh, we'd like to uh, put out a special thanks to our advisor, Dr. Morgan Benton, the ISAT department, um, the previous teams that worked on this project, and of course our friends and family that support us uh, through this endeavor. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? I actually have one question. The, the, the data that you got from those, is that open? Like so anyone has access to that? Would that be your goal too, to provide an open data? Yes, uh, once we collected enough data, we would want to make it available to any other researchers so that they could um, conduct um, experiments on it. I have a question specific to type one. Is there, there's no genetic component to that? Um, there, you mean genetically, like do you get it because of genetics? Yeah. Yeah, uh, there is some of, uh, some of that in there too. It's influenced by you know genetics as well as other environmental factors uh, after the fact. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a diabetes expert. I'm, um, I'm more of a programmer, and this project was inspired by students who, interacting with them over the years, you know, this was something that was part of their daily lives that yeah. they that they dealt with, and the more we're talking about how awful their care is, I mean, essentially when you go in for your biannual, you know, semi-annual, biannual, whatever, half a year, every six months, checkup, they look at, you know, one week's worth of really collected data, and then they tell you how you're supposed to change your life, right, which, it's more art than science, right? Uh, you know, and, and any particular doctor may not have enough um, patients that have diabetes to really be an expert <coughs> in that in that area, um, and it, it, there just hasn't been enough good data up until now in history for us to really understand what impacts your um, glucose level because. You know, it's not like one unit of glucose can metabolize 100 grams of carbohydrates. It's, it, you know, it goes up and down and depending on like what time of day it is, what you eat, how fast you eat, you know, your age, your gender, um, sleep, stress, exercise, all of those things contribute, but nobody knows how. Because we have never had a way to collect all of those variables at the same time and you know, run a comparison, and so that's what this is going to do. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy about the um, predictive model. I think that's going to be really a really key contribution. So. For the predictive model, so if you had somebody who had a glucose monitor, if that if that glucose monitor was Bluetooth enabled, would that talk directly to your app to eliminate that manual? Entering is that it's a, something a that we would goal that somebody could mm -hmm. look at doing? Yeah, um, just like with the physical activity trackers, uh, we would hope to connect uh, the API from that device to our app so that it would be seamlessly adding information at the same time. Current the current devices that are on the market tend um, you can't talk to them directly most of the time because of course this is healthcare information, so it's very very tightly. 
controlled by the HIPAA laws. Um, and so most of the time, there is some sort of wireless connection, whether it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or uh, cellular data, that sends the data directly to the company that produced the monitor. Um, but then those companies have very securely controlled uh, interfaces so that you can download the data from the company. So it's sort of, it's not direct to your device, it's sort of makes but a that record. could be a future business model for Absolutely. this app, mm -hmm. is to then partner and then they would sell you the app and those different devices. Yeah. Absolutely. Really interesting. Really great. Yeah, any so, so what did you guys try and why was it not working? Or it uh, was too... So uh, the first thing we tried was discrete time Markov chain. Um, and we were able to create a model. Um, it just was too stable. It wasn't really able to predict anything besides staying in the same you know, normal level. Um, just because uh, the data that we were given, uh, for the most part, the changes um, from state were not as often as just staying inside the state. Um, and the Bayesian change point analysis, uh, that also worked. Um, but it just didn't give us the kind of prediction that we were hoping for. It would give you a time range that you would be more at risk uh, just based on previous days. Um, but we were really trying to find one that would, you know, based on the past three inputs that you gave, you know, at two o'clock, you might go out of the normal range, um, which is not something we were able to accomplish with uh, the data sets that we were given or able to find. So the goal is you're trying to sync up uh, real-time insulin or blood glucose levels with all the different data from sleep yeah. and physical activity and time of day and stuff like that mm -hmm. to predict it. Yeah. That's cool. And you guys do have a functioning app? Is there actually an app? Yeah. That's done? Is well, I mean, it's still in development. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, there's more features that we would like to see added. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. The demo is not very exciting right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the three pages that we showed you. Oh, yeah. All right, well, if there's no more questions,